Hello everyone, this video we're going to look at pietism and it really starts in Germany with a guy named Philip Jacob Spinner in 1635 to 1705. And he was a, a priest that was supported by the state, but he was really content to just perform, preach and perform the sacraments. He saw the need to foster a, a personal faith in his parishioners, the people that went to his parish. And he established his College of Piety where he saw less uh, distance between the the hierarchy of the priesthood and then the laity that there is we are there were more in it together it was the priesthood of all leaders we are all priesthood unto god and um, even the laity needed this the greater devotion in life not just the priest and one of the things that they would do the pastors and the theologians they'd be examined to see if they were truly converted and there he emphasized and urged that pastors not uh, preach with this academic tone, but preaching was uh, just a call to believers to be obedient to the word and, and not a whole lot else. Spinner also saw that doctrine was no substitute for personal faith and that God was sovereign over justification and sanctification. So the means that one is declared right before God and also the growth of that person's life is God is sovereign over both. He was really more Calvinist than he was Lutheran. And he saw that the prophecies and revelation were being fulfilled, that the end was near, and he made these predictions that obviously did not come true. Uh, this also the same time period, uh, F.A. Lamp wrote hymns that spread this pietist theology in, in the area. And it was also uh, in Denmark that pietism gave way to successful missions to India. An important individual during this time period is Count Zinzendorf. And he had this relationship with a group of people called the Moravians. And the Moravians were really descendants of followers of John Huss that were known for their piety. And he gives them uh, asylum in his lands. He was a wealthy landowner and had this village uh, called Hernhut where uh, much of this activity went on. He became, Zinzendorf became part of a local parish and it became a center for missions. And so the Moravian missionary activity um, really reached a lot of areas but eventually they had more conflict with lutherans and ended up getting banned from germany and that's when many moravians went to went to america remember it's uh, moravians that really had an influence on john wesley um there was a short peace period with the lutherans and zinzendorf became a bishop and he claimed that there was this episcopal this passing of bishopric um from the original Huss, followers of huss to to him and he ends up cutting ties with the Lutherans, and, but the group ends up waning over time, but they still, the Moravians, la their impact on missions is going to be long lasting. Okay, we're going to really look at the foundations of the Methodist Church, and it really, really starts with Whitfield and, and not Wesley. Uh, Whitfield was a member of the Holy Club before Wesley, and there was it kind of started this group of people that met together and had this methodical lifestyle that they, where they would commit they made a covenant to lead these sober lives uh, take communion once a week um, be faithful in their the private devotions they visit the prisons spent three hours a day studying the bible in the afternoon and they were known for this methodical lifestyle and at first people called them methodists in a derogatory kind of a insulting way and whitfield heard it and he kind of liked it hey, that's kind of good so he they he allowed it and it persisted um, Whitfield had been to the colonies and back, and he preached in the open air uh, in Georgia, and he did that here in Europe, and they did not like the way that he used the pulpit there. Wesley, uh, who was rising at this time, did not like the open air preaching. Many people responded with emotional outbursts, and they were, they were, he was concerned that they wished for a more solemn proceedings, uh, but he did not want to hinder God's work because he saw, Wesley saw, the good things was happening from Whitfield's preaching, even though he didn't like it. Um, the style. Eventually the two, they worked together for a while, but then they split over the pre issues of predestination and election. Wesley ends up being more Armen Armenianism um, and more emphasis on free will, where Whitfield is more Calvinist with election. Um, Whitfield had a lousy marriage. He had in, ends up getting married to his buddy's ex-girlfriend or fiance. Um, they were betrothed and his buddy decided he could not um, follow God and, and and be married as well. So he said, hey, marry my, my ex-fiance. And she 
um, the fiance still was in love with, with the friend. And so they ended up getting married and she continued to write letters uh, to the other guy still pining after him. And even on George Whitfield and, and his wife's uh, honeymoon, he would preach twice a day while on his honeymoon. Uh, Whitfield found, found that the Calvinist Methodist Church, after splitting with from Wesley, uh, and Wesley really had no desire to start a new denomination. Um, he really wanted to still reach and make changes within the Anglican Church. Okay, so John Wesley was an Anglican priest first that was invited by the governor of Georgia, Oglethorpe, to be a pastor in Savannah. And his, but his father was a priest, and he helped um, his father for a time. And then he him he joins with his brother Charles in back in Europe in England with the Holy Club that the same club that Whitfield was a part of with these group. We already talked about their lifestyle. So he sails with a group of Moravians. Um, to to Georgia, and there was a bad storm, and the, the, the mainstay beam that w was split, and they thought the ship was going to go down, but the Moravians were found singing down in the, in the hull of the ship. They were singing, and there, everyone, there was men, women, and, and children, and they asked, them, well, aren't you afraid that you're going to die? And they were, no, they were not afraid to die. Uh, both the women, as, aren't your children afraid? And no, they're not afraid either. And so this, this shook Wesley that he, because he was scared to death, he was afraid to die. And so he ends up seeking advice of one of the Moravian pastors um, that he was working with trying to reach out to the Indians. And the pastor asked him straight up, do you have the spirit of God in you? And I will read from the, the book from uh, Justo Gonzalez's uh, story of Christianity that this uh, lecture is based off of. I want to read what the quote from uh, Wesley's journal says. It says, he said, my, my brother, I must first ask you one of two questions. Have you the witness within yourself? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? I was surprised and knew not what to answer. He observed it and asked, do you know Jesus Christ? And I paused and said, I know he's the Savior of the world. True, he replied he, but do you know he has saved you? And I answered, I, I hope he, ha he has died to save me. He only added, do you know yourself? And I said, I do. And in the PS of Wesley's uh, letter of his diary, it said, but I fear these words were vain words. So that was Wesley's own, um, that was his experience crossing over to come to America. And it shook him. We'll see how that panned out later. But when he got there and he had struggle with the the believers in Georgia because he wanted them to behave like the people back in the Holy Club and they were not having it. Wesley's brother Charles also was in the States but he got frustrated as well and ends up leaving the United States back for England. Another thing Wes Charles Wesley was famous for is his hymn writing. If you look in many of, your, of our hymn books you'll see many that, that Charles Wesley wrote. Um, John Wesley was engaged to a young woman and he cast lots to decide if he was going to marry her or not and the cat the lots came up not to marry so he, he does not marry her but then um, whenever she gets engaged to another man um, and then they're in the church he, they didn't he denies them communion and and um, the, the rest of the flock that did, didn't like that knew that this you, you can't do this you can't treat them this way and the way that he was expecting them to live like the Holy Club uh, he finally throws in the towel with them and don't want to say they ran him out, but they were glad when he left. Um, so he seeks out this Moravian pastor, Peter Bowler, it, it, that concludes that he, he lacks saving faith and wants to just quit preaching. And the pastor, Bowler, says, you need to preach faith until you have it. Don't know if that's good advice, um, but he hears someone reading Luther's introduction to Romans and the commentary that Martin Luther and it was the change that God worked in the heart through faith in Christ. And so he, he feels strangely warm and assurance that his sins have been taken away, even mine, he said, and save me from the law of sin and death. So it's at this moment that Wesley believes he is truly converted. And up until this point in his life, all that he had done uh, working in America the previous time in the Holy Club, he he believes that before this moment he was unconverted. 
So Wesley really did not intend to start a new denomination. He wanted to reach his Anglican brothers. And so he would not schedule meetings uh, during the same time as Anglican meetings. And when the, the, the Methodist meeting was, he hoped to prepare the believers for Anglican worship and be ready to take communion as the centerpiece of worship that you should do as often as possible. In Bristol, he, he organized the followers into societies that met in private homes later in buildings, and they grew too large to care for. So he grouped these societies with 12, 11 or 12 members and a leader. Um, they would meet weekly for prayer and scripture reading, and they would collect funds to help give to the poor and the needy, and he would have classes for, for women and training. Um, Wesley organized, he traveled to these organized groups, and uh, one of the things that Anglicans claimed that this disturbed parishes because still uh, crossing parish uh, jurisdictions was, was a no-no. And uh, he said, the world is my parish. Uh, John preached several times a day, traveled thousands of miles on horseback all the way till he was 70 years old. And he had gotten remarried at this time, and his marriage still suffered because of, of the, he, his, he was constantly away. Um, he raised up lay preachers. Um, there was a guy, Thomas Maxfield, had started preaching in London. He planned to go travel and stop this guy that was preaching, and someone advised him, just, just listen to him. And he would listen and realize that, <clears throat> that he did a really good job and that this was an answer to prayer and that we needed more preachers, but he didn't want them to take the place of the clergy in the Anglican church and so that these lay preachers were not to uh, administer communion. And even women could, could proclaim, could preach, so they could participate in this. Um, he organized the societies and a connection that under a circuit rider that could uh, attend to all these and they would be under the leadership of a superintendent. And he held a conference with the Anglican clergy when they uh, called the, the annual conference with the lay preachers and the clergy all together. So the Methodists uh, experienced frequent acts of violence against them. And they really, because they were made up of all different classes. There was a blend uh, of classes, not just a high, middle, and low, uh, but all of them together, not separate. And there was constant conflict with this Anglican church that he still wanted to be a part of. And so Anglican saw that if you were preaching everywhere that this was crossing the jurisdictional lines that the Anglican church that had separated um, their leadership in. He didn't, and Wesley didn't like it either, but he still wanted to reach people, so he uh, went ahead and did it. Um, there was a law that was passed that non-Anglican worship, uh, well, that any non-Anglican worship was illegal, and so you, but you had to, be, so you had to be registered and acknowledged by the government. And and so the Anglicans didn't recognize their meetings or their buildings. So Wesley finally gives the go-ahead and with his brother's counsel to go ahead and register and be acknowledged as its own church. And so this was the first cutting of the ties, um, this registering that really starts the Methodism as its own denomination. So earlier, Wesley was convinced that the early church's bishop was the same as the presbyter or the elder, and that all ordained presbyters had the power to ordain other presbyters. And during the revolution in America, the clergy in America had, had been loyalist, and so the states were in need of leadership and to be able to administer communion. And so, but Wesley supported the crown. He couldn't fathom how in the colonies they wanted freedom when they themselves had slaves. So he, he ends up ordaining two superintendents or bishops to serve in America, and they still insisted on identifying with the Church of England or the Anglican Church. And Charles, his brother, claims that this ordination of new leaders in itself was part of a break uh, from the Anglican Church. Uh, he gave up trying to conflict their meetings with the Anglican gatherings. But so by his death, the time of his death, Methodist had pretty much became its own denomination. It had great success and expansion in the West. But it, became, it became its own church in the West before it became its own church in, in Britain. Um, as you can see in the previous slide in that map that showed in less than 100 years how far and fast Methodism spread. Um, they organized the Methodist Episcopal Church, and they had, he had been sent, Co these two guys, Coke and Asbury, were these two bishops that he had uh, ordained, and they called themselves bishops. And so the Methodists in England did not have bishops where the one in America did. And that's really uh, the high points of this pietist time period 
both in England and then in the roots in America as well.